It is a Friday. Smart instruments. Slideshow from the beginning. There we go. Can you guys, boys, see that? Anybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. I, so smart instruments is basically what we'll be talking about. And I, I, I believe I have 21, version 21. I don't know what you guys are using for um, um, your ILMs, but this is version 21, I believe. So smart instruments, and again, we'll be talking about heart. So that's, that's basically um, what we focus on here is, as far as uh, smart instruments and how they work. So the objectives, describe hardware, architecture, features and operation of smart transmitters, we list the digital communication protocols and standards used with smart instruments. Um, there's a lot of protocols out there, Profi Bus and Heart and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is what we'll be talking about. A, a, a communication protocols is basically uh, a set of instructions that both your uh, smart transmitter and your communicator and your controller and all that kind of stuff will talk. Uh, they have to have the same protocols in order to send and receive, um, and we'll be talking about that. Describe the operation of handheld and personal computer interfaces used with smart transmitters. Uh, the 375s, 475s is almost gone by the wayside, and we're using the Trex. And if, I, I don't know if you guys are using Trex at work or not. Uh, those are about 10 Gs. Uh, we've we've all we, at the RDP we've gone to the Trex. So if you haven't uh, used one, you will be using them in our labs. And uh, Tyler really likes them. And uh, basically, uh, they're they're very user friendly. So they're they're kind of nice to have. Uh, we have the 375s. We don't use anymore. We never ever did buy 475s because the transition from 375s to 475s to the tracks was too fast so we just went and bought tracks now, have you guys used tracks at home at their work anybody no we just got a 475 okay okay when you when you use it okay cool uh the 475s they're just a little more clunkier they've uh the same design and everything but uh they take longer to boot up and self-diagnosis and all that kind of stuff but uh, the Trex, you're going to love them. Um, it's just like a small little computer, and it's, it's very, very user-friendly. And the last thing we're going to do is describe the advantages of smart instruments in measurement and control loops. So a transmitter, conventional pneumatic. Uh, we don't see a lot of them out there, but there's still some pneumatic transmitters out there. And then a conventional electronic, which is fine, but... The smart transmitters are what we're after here, the smart instruments, and we even have wireless at the college. So what is a smart instrument? It has a brain, and basically that's known as the microprocessor of, of the instrument. So if it's got a microprocessor, it's a little computer inside of it. It has a memory, so if you plug in all your data that you need to plug in for a control loop or for uh, whatever information you want to put in there, we can put that information in, lower range value, higher range value, or upper range value, things like that. It can perform its own calculations. So when we're looking at a, a square root extractor or something like that for flows, uh, we all know that uh, in order to calculate flow, we use a square root extractor. Uh, one of the things we have to be cautious of is that because now these smart transmitters can actually do that square rooting and then if you go to your DCS and the DCS is also able to do that square rooting, we have to be careful to do only once. Uh, different, different companies have different uh, protocols that they, they say, okay, well, we'll do all the square root extracting in the transmitter or they'll do all the square root extracting in the um, DCS. But you can only do it once. If you do it twice, then your readings are going to be square rooted again, and it doesn't work. Self-diagnostic and fault uh, reporting. This is cool. So we know we have a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, for example. The 4 milliamp signal is a live zero, which means it's not at zero. It's a live zero, so we can differentiate between a broken wire and then no signal, which one we were looking at. So 
what happens with these um, instruments, the smart instruments, if they do fail and it's failing low or failing high, they will drive your milliamp output to something, if it's going to be in the high end, something like 22 milliamps, and if it's a low end, it's like 3.5 milliamps, but it's self-diagnosed and, self, and that's fault reporting, which is really uh, important for uh, these transmitters. Uh, sends and receives data, so it communicates, no problem. Uh, can condition signals using A to Ds and D to As, so analog to digital and digital analog, uh, and we talked about that earlier on in this program. And easier to uh, for us to maintain. And it says maybe not to use though, because it depends how hard they are, right? Um, some of some of them of these smart instruments, you've got to have a whole manual to learn how to work them. So sometimes it says it's easier for us to maintain, but sometimes we have to learn the program first. And use heart or there's some kind of a communication protocol. And the heart is what we'll be using and talking about mostly. So here's your smart transmitter and a conventional trans electronic transmitter. So the one on the right is your electronic transmitter. And those were uh, the progression from the pneumatic ones. Uh, they did a lot, but they didn't have a brain. They're just completely electronic, uh, A to D, D to A, but they don't have a microprocessor in them. When you look at this smart transmitter on the left, it's got that microprocessor. So hardware architecture, features, uh, the operation, whoops, sorry. So we'll be talking about hardware architect features and the operation of the smart transmitter. So smart transmitter differ in most ways due to their smartness. Basically, provisions are made for analog to digital conversions and associated comp, uh, components related to the microprocessor. So basically it has a brain, it has a microprocessor. So here's, here's uh, a chart and it shows you actually uh, with the smart transmitter of all the circuitry and all the, the characteristics of these smart transmitters and starting from the uh, temperature sensor interface circuit so that would be your field uh, sensor it has a reference junction temperature sensor so if i'm using uh, these smart transmitters for anal uh, for um, thermocouples or rtds it's got temperature compensation uh, sometimes when we're looking uh, using flow we need temperature compensation, so it has that built in. And then, of course, it goes up to the um, analog to digital converter, so A to D converter, and we talked about those before, into the isolation circuit, which is galvanically isolated. So that means there's no wires, uh, um, physical wires attached. It's, it's an isolation circuit. And then we go in and get into the characterization memory and the microprocessor and the configuration memory. Um, and then uh, if it's going out to a final control element, we have a D to A converter. And then we also have a modem inside of the smart transmitter. My Xenia regulator on the bottom uh, right, that's what keeps my, um, uh, it, it regulates my voltage to the, uh, to the smart transmitter. And then if you look up in the top right, we have a reverse polarity protection diode. And that's, your, that's actually your test points. So you can actually put a, a, a meter on your test points and if you can measure the milliamp that is going through that circuit without opening the circuit, because on those test points of the smart transmitter, basically you're just go crossing that uh, reverse polarity diode. Uh, and, and you guys have seen all those uh, where it says on those instruments, the test. Um, so basically you can just fire on um, an analog or, or I should say, um, a milliamp uh, multimeter, put it on there, and it can test your uh, your amperages and things like that, which is cool because you don't have to break the circuit. So characterization memory, it's got a configuration memory, it's got a, a D to A converter, ah, it's got a modem. Uh, modem is a modulator, demodulator, so that's how they interpret signals. So they do share some of the same similarities uh, between an electronic and a smart. So reverse polarity diode is on, on a, uh, did, uh, basically on a smart transmitter as well as an electronic transmitter. So you have a Xenia regulator also, which basically gives you the proper uh, voltage and isolation power supply, which is the isolation circuit, which is galvanic isolation and sensor circuits. So, if I look at a smart transmitter and look at Linux, they do share a few of the things. 
So this is a smart transmitter like we showed you last on the last page. And this one is just electronic transmitter. So you can see that there's a bunch of things missing like characterization, memory, isolation circuits, uh, things like a modem. So it's, it's basically a, a big step up and it's because they're smart, they have a microprocessor. If you look at the just electronic one, it's got analog to digital, a digital processor, and then digital analog, so very simple. Where I have a smart transmitter, it has a brain, it has the microprocessor and the memories. Okay. So reverse polarity diode, that's the one we were talking about, prevents damage from incorrect connections, as well as facilitating the test points. We've all done that. We've all gone out to a transmitter and put a, uh, put a, a milliamp reading across it, and it picks up the milliamps. And the beauty of that is, again, you don't have to open that circuit. Uh, do not use test points for calibration. So when, I, when we're doing a calibration, we never use those test points because we have that diode there, and there's a 0.7 volt drop across that diode. So our, our, if we calibrate it, it's going not to be as accurate as it could be. And again, why don't we do that? It's because there's this 0.7 volt drop across that diode. Zener regulators creates a stable voltage for the internal circuitry and, I, and isolated power supply. And then isolated power supply input and output circuits must be separate from each other. And the reason for this is that it doesn't introduce any noise. Um, this provides a, a power supply for input isolation and output power supply. Sensor circuits used when uh, instrument signals require amplification, such as an RTD or, or thermocouple. So reference junction temperature sensor. Uh, this is really important uh, because we need to have this reference junction there. So it provides the cold reference junction temperature needed with thermocouples. And maybe or, or a thermistor, RTD, or whatever we're using. Uh, they just have that reference temperature sensor. The problem with the reference temperature sensor is it's inside the actual transmitter, and they the 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 sensor could be, you know, uh, 50 feet, 60 feet away. So those temperatures may change. So we have to be cognizant of this as far as uh, that reference junction temperature sensor, because if it's at the if if it's at the temp if it's at the um, transmitter itself, and the uh, the sensor is like 50 yards away or whatever, then it's not possibly not going to be the same temperature. But they do have a reference temperature sensor. Uh, ADC and DAC, so analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter. We talked about that in the first, one of the first <coughs> ILMs. Isolation circuit, an optical isolator provides electrical isolation of the ADC signal to the microprocessor. So this is accomplished by using the digital signal to cause an opto isolator to emit light pulses, which create current pulses, which are converted back into those digital signals. And if you guys remember, we did that uh, isolation, I think it was last lecture. Electrical isolation, is it's its sole purpose. So microprocessor does all the computing, such as calculations for sensor linearization, calibration, trans transmitter characterization, storage, and recall and communications. So this is what we were missing with just an electronic transmitter. Characterization memory holds table values for thermocouples and linearization values, et cetera. It holds all our tables. And configuration memory, this is all inputted what we do, we sit there and input it, uh, as, such as ID, range values, units, use the battery backed up RAM device. RAM is volatile memory. So if, if we lose that uh, power to the RAM, we lose the RAM. So that's why it's battery backed up. Uh, the modem provides digital communication over the signal wires by superimposing an AC signal over a DC loop current. And pulsating the loop current, and we'll be—I'll show you some of those uh, uh, basically diagrams where we do that. Configuration: so we rearrange remote communications. That's kind of cool. We can talk to these things way back in the, uh, where they uh, are powered up or in the field. It doesn't matter as long as we get as long as we 
are, are on the loop, we can communicate with them. Linearization, dampening, self-diagnostics, increased accuracy. Uh, some of this equipment that we are um, trying to uh, configure and trying to uh, basically chase, check the accuracy and stuff like that. A lot of these smart transmitters are um, they're they're more accurate than our calibrators, and you guys have probably come across that in the field where uh, these smart transmitters are very very accurate, and sometimes they have less accuracy than the communicator or more accuracy than the communicator that we're doing. Features, configuration, has everything to do with the setup of the device, setting ranges, units, sensor type, and uh, dampening, for example. Rearranging, so this can be done now without actually applying for a standard to the transmitter. Remote communications, again, this is possible anywhere as long as you're on the loop somewhere with a handheld computer. Communication is like two-way telephone. Linearization. We can achieve by the use of characterization tables, and this compensates for values that are off the slope between lower range value and upper range value. This is one of the biggest benefits of the smart transmitter. So dampening. Uh, dampening is used to eliminate rapidly fluctu fluctuating input signals. So if you see, uh, if you see all of these signals, they're just ba basically going up and down, up and down. Um, it, we can dampen it with, with these smart transmitters. So the input signal, here we have dampening and after dampening. So before dampening, you can see those signals going up and down, up and down. And that's that's what we call noise. And it could be electromagnetic interference. It could be anything. But uh, with this dampening, it could even be vibration. But then we can dampen it. So you're looking at your signal uh, before dampening and after dampening in this case. So self-diagnostic, that's a huge feature. It's a feature that runs the background and will report the general health and loop of the transmitter. So we don't have to actually monitor that transmitter and see what it's doing or all that kind of stuff because if it's failing, it'll tell us because it has a smart brain. When failure occurs, the signal will drive an extreme, uh, drive an extreme that is configured to the name your NE43. And that's the, uh, the group that sets what the value will be. So if it's a low, if, it's, uh, if it fails below 4 milliamps, it's going to give us a signal of 3.6 milliamps. And if it fails high, it's going to give us uh, greater or equal to 21 milliamps. And then we know basically that there is a loop failure or a transmitter failure. Um, if somebody, if, if some, uh, or, or if the loop becomes broken, this transmitter will see that and it will fail to 3.5 milliamps. So accuracy in comparison, they are quite different. So here's an analog transmitter in the middle and the smart electronic transmitter uh, on the right. And you analog transmitters, and you guys have probably used these, they are not the most accurate, but plus or minus 0.2%, where my smart electronic uh, transmitter is 0.05 percent so there's quite an increase um, in accuracy on that repeatability is another thing repeatability means that uh, you measure once and then you measure the same thing twice and it's it becomes uh, the same number that you've measured and that you were talking about or that you were thinking it would come with the analog who knows what you're going to get i mean if i if i set my uh if i set my uh and uh, a transmitter to uh, 12 milliamps and then I move it up and then I come back down to the 12, it could be 12.365 or something like that, right? So the repeatability is, is huge um, for an analog transmitter, 0.05%. And then for smart, it's 0.025%. So uh, that gets into pretty small numbers, which is, uh, is great for re repeatability. Stability. Um, 0.2% of calibration span for six months, and we look at stability for our smart transmitter, it's 0.1, so it's half, <coughs> so it's way more stable than the analog transmitter. And then again, with, with the temperature compensation we have, so an analog transmitter wouldn't have that, so it's 0.75%, and because the smart transmitters do, it's 0.1. So when we're working with analog transmitters, we uh, know that there's a better option, which would be the smart. 
and I don't know the analog transmitters right now, like uh, you have the pots to zero and pots to span, uh, but you don't, you can't find those very much anymore. Everything's gone to digital and smart. Alrighty, moving on. Much of the improvement is due to the characterization and its ability to measure secondary variables like ambient temperature and static pressure. Configuration is something that uh, the analog transmitter doesn't have. So when I buy an analog transmitter way back when, I would have to buy it and order it with all the specs already done. So they do the specs in the lab or at the factory. Um, with a, with a uh, smart transmitter, I can configure it as soon as I get it and configure it to what I want. But configuration, it must be ordered the way you need it and can't easily be changed. Smart transmitters can change it a lot. So convention calibration is adjusting the 4 to 20 milliamp output to match the input standard or range value and upper range value that is applied. So we can do that pretty easily. Trim makes internal interpretation of the input signal. Uh, when you have an output trim or an input trim, we on the smart transmitter, we go in there and we set it ourselves with what we want it to do. So it's an internal interpolation of the input signal. Sensor trim is done by applying a standard to the transmitter that modifies the way the, the sensor is thinking. So basically it's called sensor trim. Zero trim, if no pressure or temperature, whatever we're measuring is being applied to the transmitter, the output is not zero. A zero trim will move that offset uh, without affecting the range. Of, this is one point adjustment. Full sensor trim is a two pointed process. Just like conventional calibrations, we go to the lower range value, upper range value, and we do sensor trims at both. Analog output trim is done to calibrate the output of the, uh, the digital analog controller. With communicator, we can tell the transmitter to output four or 20 milliamp signal. So we can just do that and then we can get our, our, our output and input. We then measure the actual output of the transmitter with a meter. And if it's not identical, basically we form an analog output trim to make a match. Because our, uh, again, when we do this, sometimes when we do this, the transmitter is smarter than, uh, or has more accuracy than the meters that we use which can cause an issue sometimes. When perform a trim on a smart transmitter, the calibrator must be more accurate than the transmitter. So again, it says not usually the case though. With the, the development of these smart transmitters, uh, their accuracy is, is better than the calibrators themselves. So in conclusion, you must verify this sensor and uh, digital analog converter when calibrating a smart transmitter. Heart, heart protocol, now you'll be, you'll, you know this because you've probably seen this and heard of this lots in, the, in your instrumentation career. Highway addressable remote transducer. And this was developed by Fisher Rosemount to retrofit a 4 to 20 milliamp current loop transducer with digital communications. So what it's saying is that I have a, a 4 to 20 milliamp signal going through my loop. And on top of that, I superimpose this highway addressable remote transducer. So what does it look like? Well, I'll show you in a second. So the heart, heart modulates the 4 to 20 mAh current with a low level frequency shift key. So this is this is a definitely going to be something you're going to have to know is that frequency shift keying. So it's a low level frequency shift keying sine wave signal without affecting the average analog signal at all. So it doesn't affect the analog signal because it's about frequency. Heart uses the frequency of 1200 hertz and 2200 hertz to deal with poor cabling, and its rate is 1200 baud, which is su uh, sufficient for that. Heart uses Bell 202 modem technology. ADSL technology was not available in 1989 when, when the Heart was developed, um, so it uses Bell 202. So what is HART? It's a standard of protocol, which is a set of instructions that the receiving and transmitting devices have to have to be able to communicate with, with each other. HART is a protocol. So this is a certain way the system communicates. Uh, you can have a HART transmitter, uh, but if it's a sender or receiver, it has to have the same protocol to be able to communicate. So protocol deals with the signal, method of rules and communication, 
like the type of data size, the size of the messaging, the speed of the transmission, response time, and other non-physical attributes. So standards specify how the data is transmitted and the physical attributes of the system. This is like cable type, connectors, shielding, voltage levels. Most of these are uh, quantitative values. The Bell 202 is a standard for communication for smart devices. So other protocols that uh, that were out there, Foundation Field Bus, H1. We got Pro, uh, Profi Bus Automation. We have Honeywell DE. So these are all protocols. So these all have their own set of instructions. Some of them are proprietary, priport, oh geez, proprietary, which means that you have to buy them. And some are open, anyone can use for free. And that's hard. Heart protocol enables two-way digital communication on existing shielded twisted pair. So it's on our 4 milliamp signal. It is the only one that does this. The others have more stringent wiring requirements. We can use twisted pair with heart. I think, and it's not proprietary, so that's why it's used so much. So both a transmitter, the IO must have heart to get these smart benefits. It requires both to have heart modems. As I say, your transmitter has to have the heart protocol as well as your receiver. This is the only protocol that can be analog to digital at the same time. So on, it superimposes frequencies on my analog um, signal. So here, here we have here, we got that analog signal is in the red, and then we have a digital signal uh, that is basically uh, waveform. And now if you look at it, there's, this is where we get our 1200 hertz and, and we get a zero uh, high frequency and we get a one at low frequency. So it sends these packets of ones and zeros, ones and zeros, ones and zeros that are interpreted uh, by the transmitter or they're sent by the transmitter interpreted by the receiver. So two simultaneously communication channels. One is going to be the analog signal and the other one is frequency shift keying. So frequency shift, if I shift my frequency of, of, of those signals, it becomes a 1 or a 0, uh, which is binary data. A 4 to 20 milliamp signal is, is basically uh, the red. And a digital signal superimposed over analog signal is going to be your heart communication signal. So 1200 hertz represents a 1. So 1200 is, uh, and that's how I frequency shift. So I've got 1200 for a one, and then I got 2200 represents a zero. So as these packets go by, I've got a communication that's on the binary scale. So that's my that's my communication is binary. Uh, if I look at this uh, drawing, I've got a one because I've got a 1200 to start, and then I have zero zero because between those lines I've got two high frequencies. And then I get a 1-1 one, one when the frequency goes to 1,200 again. So basically, it's a 1,200 hertz or 2,200 hertz. And it's sent along the, the, um, the same wires and the same as an analog signal. And it just sends packets of numbers, which, is, which are identified uh, through the binary system. So that's called frequency shift keying. So I shift my frequency from high, uh, from 22 to 1200 and back or whatever I want it, whatever I'm sending for data uh, as a ones and zeros. So it's called frequency shift keying. And you can see how this frequency shifts along from high frequency to a low frequency to high frequency and low frequency. There's no in between frequencies. It's either 1200 or 2200 with heart representing ones and zeros. This is, uh, this is uh, basically what we can see and what we will, will see when we uh, do go into the lab. Uh, we'll be able to bring up this uh, um, with our uh, uh, specs or our, our scopes. We got the 123 scopes. We'll see, actually see this other than the color. We, we don't have a red and we don't have a, a, a blue, but you'll be able to see this. Uh, um, this communication over a analog signal. So here we can see a command and response. So basically it's two-way communication. Uh, the C or the blue uh, is colored and it is actually a command and the red is the response. Now if we blow, it shows you here with that 
uh, the response on the top, it shows you the frequency shift keying there. Um, you, we can't see that with our eyes here, but if we've blown up that portion, you can see that you've got 1200 hertz and 2200 hertz. So you have a one and a zero. So that, that whole packet there of these commands and responses are, are packets of ones and zeros. So how we addressable remote transducer interfaces. And here's basically we have heart capable uh, calibrators. We had field communicators. And again, we'll be using uh, a scope, a 123 scope, and we'll be using uh, a communicator to, to look at these, uh, look at these sing, uh, symbols and, and signals. And of course, we do have the Merriam there too, but we haven't used that for a long time. So they can be remotely calibrated, which is kind of a cool. Now we're talking again about the transmitter, smart transmitters. We can, we can actually calibrate them from somewhere nice and warm in the MCC or a Martian cabinet or something like that. So that's one of the benefits too. Highway addressable allows us to connect in parallel anywhere on the loop wiring except across the power supply. So this is important for us to know that if we need at least a 250 ohm resistor in in that loop uh, so that we can get that communication. So if we go straight across the power supply, there is not a 2250 ohm resistor. So there's no resistance for there and it won't communicate. We have to be somewhere uh, beyond the power supply to hook up our communicator. The instrument uh, parameters can quickly and easily be changed uh, from our communicator. Device descriptors. Device descriptors are like software driver programs. They tell a communicator what is connected to. Uh, this in turn manages the menu tree when we uh, configure that transmitter. Um, if the correct DD is not available, some communications will have um, um, digital device generators that may work with limited configuration functionality. Interfaces, aside from using a handheld communicators, we can use a PC. So we can actually use a personal computer to um, as an interface. All we need is a heart modem adapter that connects to the serial or USB port of your computer. Once you have that heart modem, uh, then we can communicate. Again, that would be our, uh, that would be transmitter and receiver. We use a viator modem in our lab. So we actually have a um, heart modem in our lab. Uh, this, this just talks about multiplexers, which we talked about before. It talks about um, all these transmitters that are smart transmitters in the field. They come to a heart mux, which is a multiplexer. And depending how we set this multiplexer up and depend on the importance of the... Uh, field transmitters or the field loops, we can uh, take the signal from whichever loop we want as a priority. And, and then of course, just we just program it to which one's more important than the other. The multiplexer basically is uh, where all the signals come in and it's, it's got to have heart communication also there. So all of these transmitters will come to this, this heart mux or multiplexer and then we will get all the signals from all our loops in our in the field and we can uh, basically we can adjust to see which uh, which one's more important or which one we should scan more things like that so allows connections of multiple hard devices to a single comms port it will sequence sample the active data and transmit it i to the control system Advantage in measurement uh, and control loops. A measurement loop, transmit the PV to the control system. If in a control loop, transmit the control signal to the final control element, which is more, normally a valve, but it doesn't have to be. So advantages in, uh, is high accuracy, uh, less recalibration. Uh, these tr smart transmitters will tell you if they need to be cal uh, calibrated. Temperature compensation is hugely important, as I talked about. Uh, but you just have to be careful if your sensor is not the same place where your transmitter is, that separate temperature compensation could uh, ill affect your measurement. Multiple input programmability, failure diagnostic features, which we talked about, fail high, fail low, especially if it's an analog signal. 
remote configuration, which is a beauty, and secondary info via data communications. So we can have secondary information there, things like um, what it's hooked to, what, what the loop is, blah, 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 identification of some sort. So we look at this, we got, the, uh, a, we got a controller system, which is the host, and it's a primary master. It goes out to uh, the slaves, which are the field devices. Uh, the also, in this case here, it has a handheld terminal uh, that we can use out in the field or anywhere along the loop, except directly across the power supply. Heart technology is a master-slave protocol, which means that the smart field slave a device only speaks when spoken to by the master. So uh, each one of these devices that's in the field has its own address. So the other ad, the other uh, field devices do not communicate unless they are addressed. So the heart protocol can be used in various modes, such as point-to-point -point or a multi-drop. In this case, which you're seeing right here on the screen is the multi-drop for communicating information to, from smart field instruments and center control for monitoring the system. Smart instruments can be used in non-polling mode with an address of zero. Uh, this is going to this is kind of cool. So I have the address on on uh, these transmitters is zero to fifteen, which they have. In other words, you have, can have sixteen on on a loop, and they're all addressed from zero to fifteen, which is sixteen different addresses. If you address a smart transmitter to zero, it becomes non-polling and it becomes an analog. Um, and we'll be doing this actually in the lab. We'll, we'll address these smart transmitters to zero. And once it's a zero, it becomes an analog transmitter, which doesn't have the smarts anymore. And the reason is because we address it to zero. And it's about polling, right? So, or the polling mode. So if I want to pull these ad, uh, addresses of these other uh, devices that are in the field, I have to address them between 1 and 15. Bidirectional communication is possible, aka duplex communicator. Advantages of control loops, smart positioners auto calibrate themselves. So that's why they're saying there's less calibration needed for the smart transmit positioners or transmitters. Smart positioners can be remotely configured, needs less calibration, obviously, if they're calibrating themselves. Provides secondary information, self diagnostics. So the um, heart protocol review protocol is set of rules establishing how the devices will communicate both your transmitter and your receiver has to have those to communicate heart uses a 4 to 20 milliamp signal with a sinusoidal wave superimposed over it for control and communication so it doesn't affect the 4 to 20 milliamp signal but over that we have uh, we have a waveform that's superimposed and again it's 1200 or 2200 for zeros and ones frequency shift keying uh, is, that's how heart works. So it uses the protocol of 1200 hertz, represents a logic of one, and 2200 hertz represents a logic of zero. So these packets of one and zeros are binary, which means something as far as how we configure this with the pro, uh, heart protocol. So smart transmitter modes, online, connected and configured, a real transmitter, offline, simulating, come on, Offline simulating a transmitter and configuring and storing device settings, configuration and data. And you can upload configuration from the transmitter to the communicator. And we'll be doing that also. You can download hard configuration from the communicator to the transmitter. The cons of this, slower than analog due to the conversion of a D to A. So we all think that these digital transmitters are faster than the analog transmitters, but in a digital transmitter, and I'm, we're talking milliseconds here, so it's not a it's not a huge difference, but they're slower than the analog due to the conversion from the digital to analog, and then of course they have to go analog to digital, so a little bit slower. Needs a special communicator, so on these uh, you just can't put a multimeter or something like that. You need a communicator. Uh, obviously, you need training with these things. Uh, no industry standard, so some manufacturers use proprietary systems like Honeywell where you have to buy, but there's no industry standard for heart, which is cool because it's free and fig rules. And that's basically our, uh, our 
stint on smart transmitters or smart instruments. So what if what does FIG mean to you guys in the field? Have you ever been called a FIG? Have I lost you? I uh, hope I didn't lose you guys. All right, yeah. boys, well, that's it. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, you, here. yeah you, I didn't lose you? No, no, I'm still here. <laughs> oh, perfect. So you know what a FIG means? Yeah, I heard this once. <laughs> it's fabulous instrument, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell that, that to the electricians. So a FIG is a fabulous instrument guy. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for putting up with me. Uh, I will stop this recording. Let's get out of here. There we go. So again, next week, boys, you're going to have the 